I know you, uh, I'm always appreciative when people come. And we said we would start at 10.30, so I know people have a day in front of them. And every time I look out and we invite people and they come, it makes me feel very good. Because uh, this is why we do it. And I would hate to have everybody around here uh, work so hard and people not to show up and enjoy what we're doing. Because this is what we do. We do it for the community and we do it hopefully so that people will enjoy coming and enjoy being part of it. So I thank you all. Needless to say, I sort of come in at the end and just introduce the artist and then sort of share some observations, but I don't really do the work to set up the shows. We have a great team here. Gabriel, Rosanna, Mario, Jay, Jody, Cecilia. I want to thank them because this is a radical transformation from the last show, which was Harry Benson. So every time there's a new show, there's a mountain of work that goes along with it. They do not let me do that work. I think they think I'm gonna mess up. So <laughs> they just bring me in at the end to say hello, to welcome people, and to say how pleased I am to have the work up in the gallery. I also want to thank Michael Eastman and his wife, Gail. They are incredibly delightful people, and they made the trip, and uh, it's been just a sort of a two-year relationship, two and a half years. But I want to say to Michael, like, where have you been all my life? I mean, the, the, the pictures look so great. Um, just from our observations last year in our first show, most all, you know, most of the pictures sold, found homes, people love the pictures, and there is just a comfort and a wonderful, kind of not only are they outstanding pictures, and not only do they resonate with everybody on a human level, but they're, they're kind of amazingly beautiful and easy to live with. And they look nice here. We get them into people's homes. And they, are, they look like they've always been meant for those spaces, regardless of whether they go to contemporary or traditional spaces. So I wanted to talk a little bit, and I'm gonna do, Michael's gonna do a lot of the talking, so you're not gonna have to listen to me. But I want to tell you a little bit about architecture of places transformed through time. There's three photographers who, whose work is up and who are components of the show. And they all three set on architecture, but they have very different desires. They use the camera very, very different. And the pictures are very different kind of studies of architecture. The first is Karen Noor. Some of her work is here. She finds sacred places that are well-preserved, sort of immaculate, that are culturally very, very rich places. And the animals that are in them are really anthropomorphic. They're out of arms for human beings. And the question she raises is these animals need unbridled, uncontrolled freedom. They have symbolic values. And how do you reconcile the constraints of cultural beauty and richness and conformity um, with free will and individual needs. So her picture, she uses architecture to make almost a social component, social statements. Andre Lichtenberg, which are the big black pieces that you see flanking both the east and the west wall and the upstairs um, seascapes, are composite images that take about four to six months for each one to make. In the cities, you have London and Paris, in Paris, it's a composite made of about 30 different images that he's taken with a high-resolution camera that he carefully knits together. But his interest is in architecture and his interest is in drawing. So what happens is he, once he carefully stitches all of these files together, he reverses all of the values. He strips out a lot of the color. So the pieces look like beautiful, beautiful drawings. And he's not interested really in the human element of the city or the architecture. He just likes the organic forms and you're always gonna see cranes and you're always gonna see activity in the pictures and the way the cities change. But he would be the purest play on uh, deconstructivist architecture. Because this is what he wants is to look at the organic structures and see them as beautiful extrapolated drawings. Michael Eastman's work, on the other hand, or the work that we're concentrating on showing because there's so many different bodies over five decades of Michael's work, 
It's really about our human connection to spaces that have served as vessels to shelter us, to contain us, and to embrace our lives. His interest really is in the marriage of bringing together seemingly opposites of change and consistency. Our connection to the past and the way people live in a, a structure in the present is incredibly important to Michael. So the pictures, really without a person being there, have an emotive and human component that some of the other pictures don't have. And the classic American architectural pictures do not have. So Michael's unique in that sense that the pictures are so warm and embrace us uh, without us being there. Just a little background on Michael. Um, he's got over five decades of photography work. He started as a classic photographer, interested in Ansel Adams, interested in uh, Edward Weston, shooting work that was black and white traditional work. And in the 70s, he started to uh, experiment in color. And the trips that we're going to look at from uh, Havana to the United States, to Europe, were basically made from 1999 on. Michael's work is collected in San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, the High Museum, the Metropolitan Museum, the Inst International Center of Photography in New York, it goes on and on. So in the numerous books in print, we are very lucky to have Michael as part of our gallery. He is an esteemed career. So my first question would be, Michael, what got you started in photography? Um, being ADD, and if I had been uh, a live child today, I'd probably have an ADD trip. Because I, when I was started in 72, came back from um, University of Wisconsin and wondered what I was going to do. I had no clue, but I knew that whatever I had to do I had to have a pretty short span of time because I, I couldn't hold things. And um, photography, a long, a long time in photography is a 30th of a second. And so it was perfect for me because I was able to make a photograph immediately. Uh, when I started, I was dating a, a young woman that was pretty. I, I asked if I could take pictures. She said, sure. I made pictures, went to a dark room. Somebody told me what trays to put it in. I printed it. And all of a sudden, I had a piece of artwork. And they were pretty. They were pretty because the girl was pretty, not because I did. <laughs> um, but that was really the immediacy of, of photography, the democracy of photography, that all of us can, be, can make photographs, take pictures, can be part of our lives. It, 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 it really began that there with the ease in which it, I could actually create something. When we look at your pictures, regardless of whether they are pictures of American architecture or whether they're shot in Buenos Aires or whether they're shot in Lisbon, Portugal or whether they're shot in Havana, we notice that most architectural photographers shoot architecture, shoot pure forms, pure shapes. You're very different in that, in that what you're really concentrating on is texture, color, and form. Can you tell us about your interest in that? And I would also say that um, nothing that you do is sort of artificially aged. You're looking for something very specific. How do you go about finding what you're looking for and what is it that you're looking for? Um, when I first began, and I started in the 70s, um, I did a lot of really abstract, detail architecture. So I taught myself composition, um, how, what, what a good picture is, in terms of finding shapes that are both, have some dynamics that are a little bit out of whack, and then also some resolution to that. So that first 10 years, my first 10,000 hours, were spent looking at walls, looking at detail, and learning how to make a frame. A friend of mine once asked, you and I go photograph sometimes, you know, we're in front of the same thing, we both have a camera, it's the same day, same light, we shoot it, mine stink and yours are great, why? <laughs> and I, I said, and I wasn't trying to be smart, I just said, I know where to put the camera. And it's really about moving the camera an inch here, an inch there, lowering it, 
moving the foot, the foot over to the right and the left, it changes all of the relationships. And I used to drive my family crazy because I'd be talking to them and, and, all, and all of a sudden they'd realize I was, had one eye and I was looking <laughs> for the right place to put the camera. They said, stop that. And, um, but it's, it's how I learned to see. And I think that, um, you know, Ansel Adams once said that you, you can move a mountain range 100 miles by moving the camera a couple inches. Mm -hmm. So that beginning was me learning what the frame was and learning how, where to put the camera. No, I think, um, and there is so much of what you do has an emotional or emotive aspect of it. I think, you know, if you were a writer, you certainly wouldn't be uh, Hemingway, you wouldn't be Dashiell Hammett, you would be like Marcel Proust, or you would be like uh, Borges. That your interest in things is in the details, is in the curtains, is in the floors, is in the well wet. And this is the writers that talk about ambiance. Your pictures have such a beautiful ambiance. How do you find places to photograph? Well, that's the hardest part. Um, it's, it's basically, I'm a, I'm a hunter. Um, I'm always searching, I'm always looking. Um, sometimes with these Cuba pieces, people ask me where these interiors are. Um, the one with the laundry and the two chairs was a building that I saw driving um, when we first got there. And there was a huge hole in a vitral -like, green vitral -like roof. And I thought, what the heck's going on? So I knocked on the door and walked in and that was the situation. Another lucky uh, situation was being in the elevator at the hotel with all my equipment at the end of the day, going back to my room, and the guy that got in after me said, oh, you're a shooter. And I go, yeah. He said, I do a production, I have a production company here in Atlanta, located in this hotel. If you want to look at our files. That was your first trip? Yeah. Wow. And so he, and we had a relationship after that. So part of it's that. Um, part of it's when I first started, I just spent a lot of time driving and rubbernecking. So, um, you know, just looking out the window and looking there. Drives my wife crazy. She's convinced I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill us both. <laughs> Drive into the, I don't know what. But it's, it's true, I, I, I do work a lot. So it's mostly, uh, it's just time spent and uh, walking around scouting, looking to be, to respond to things. And you know, it's funny, I, I, I respond, the, the more I do this, the more I respond uh, in my heart, in my heart, whatever. Uh, I, I get a sense and a feeling about it. And what scares me mostly is that most of the time when I go through uh, the, the day or when I'm shooting or whatever, I'm not feeling much at all. When I go out and photograph, that's exactly what I'm looking for, is those moments, those little hints, that little glimpse of something that doesn't quite make sense, but that I have interest in what is that? Why do I feel something? And sometimes I like to make photographs where I don't, I don't answer the question that I actually ask. When Mario interviewed you, I think one of your quotes was, I think that my images, when successful, are very emotional. Just as a side note, um, if, you're a, if you own a photography gallery, there's so many photographers, and you've done it for a long time and you seem to be able to pay the bills and you seem to be fairly successful at what you do, you get inundated with um, photographers that want you to show their work and uh, unsolicited uh, things come always in the mail. Now fortunately they're mostly emails. But when you look at a picture, if a picture for it truly to be remarkable, and I'm saying this based on what Michael has said, a picture has to engage more than your eyes. A great picture starts with what you see. Then, as it tags more of your senses, your senses of memory, your senses of emotion, your senses of psychology, your fears, your loves, your desires, your intellect, a great picture will always recruit as many other senses as possible. And if somebody makes a picture of a beautiful sunset and palm trees and tigers and lions and, and they show it to me, you know, I say it's a great picture, but the picture owns you. You don't own the pictures. You haven't 
found a picture as a vehicle to say something that you want to say, something that touches you, something that's important to you and moves you. And I think part of the key of the richness of Michael's photographs is he's finding something in there that he connects with. And every great photograph that you look at, whether you know it or not, is based on making connections. I think what's nice about Michael's pictures in a way is when you look at all of the pictures, it looks like they welcome you to enter into the room. If you look at Candida Hoffer, if you look at um, Gregory Proustin, if you look at a lot of the other photographers that have had remarkable use of architecture, you are sort of a voyeur. You're looking at a space apart from the space. What I think is so nice in Michael's work is it's very warm, it's very welcoming, it's like he and Gail are. You know, you want to enter into the room, you want to spend time there. So I think that's really part of the pull and part of the joy of experiencing and living with the work. Can I ask you about the two NEA grants that you got? Were any of them for architectural photography? Or where did they start and what did you do with those? Um, they were, there was, a, there was a program, Five Choose Five, which is five artists pick five young artists. And I got that twice from two artists in St. Louis. Um, and what it did is allow me to build a studio, which uh, I still have, still use, because I didn't have any place really to, to put my work out, to have tables, to have any kind of storage or anything. It, it was significant. It wasn't for, sh for shooting, it was more just a reward for what I had done and the potential that I had. We're gonna start to look at some of the slides. I mean, Michael's not gonna talk about all the slides, but I, I think um, it's, Nice for you to have something to look at as you hear us chatter away up here. Well, one, one thing I was, as I'm looking at the preview of these things, one thing about these images, the one thing we kind of talked about, that I think what I'm always looking for in an, in an interior, I mean, I know this is gonna sound strange, but I feel like I'm making a portrait of the people that live in the space. They're not there, but they're presences. And the stronger that is, the, the, I think in some ways the more powerful the photograph is, and the more questions it asks. The other thing I want to talk about for a second about that is the size of these prints. They're big. I've always shot, carried a four by five or an eight by ten camera around, so that I would be able to enlarge them this big. I couldn't afford to enlarge them for a long, long time, but I had the the, the negative to be able to do it. And the reason for that is that you can actually go into the space. You can see what the photos on the mantle are. You can start to really tell a story about who those people are because they're big, because they're, they're, the information is there. As we look at uh, the work that started the architectural work, which is that you're best known for, which starts with the Cuba pictures, there is a quotation that uh, also with your, if you haven't read it, we have, and Mario's a content writer, he's, he's great. He's done a series called, you know, Dialogues with Great Photographers. And there's a whole, you know, interview that he's done which you can get a lot of information and you can sort of start to see where Michael's coming from and what makes him unique. But one of the, his quotes was, photographers are always historians regardless of their intent. So do you see yourself as a historian which is really sort of romantic or kind of a magical bend to you? I, I think what I'm doing is capturing something in, in time. And, um, I remember once I made a photograph um, of a building, Deco building in Wisconsin with a big cargo van in front of it, which I hated. I just thought, God, I wish that guy would move. In fact, I remember waiting for, hoping that it would move so I could shoot it. And I went ahead and photographed it, and I remember that um, uh, when I printed it, I, I, I showed it at a, at, a, at a gallery, and somebody came up and said, I really love this photograph, but I hate that car movie. And I said, huh. I said, and I thought, you know, in 50 years, that's the thing people are going to look at. That car go and they're going to say, what the heck was that? that you know, how many people did it hold? You know, it because they would, in 50 years, maybe there wouldn't be cars. So you realize that everything you photograph, the interest that you have, will be looked at 50, hopefully be looked at again in 50 years, or 100 years, to see what it was like then. 
And when you think of a Walker Evans photographs of the 30s and the buildings and the cars and the way things look, it's, it's, it's as important as the art that he was trying to make. And so I think they're both really important, equally important. So the pictures that we're looking at were when Michael travels and makes the early trips, it is these trips and the work in 2000, 2002, were done with sheet film, were done with a large camera, were done with tripods. Can you tell me something about, you know, working in Cuba and what it was sort of like to, um, to set up? And what people, how did you have to convince people to let them into your personal spaces? Their yeah, spaces. Yeah, in ninety in ninety nine when I went, it wasn't um, wasn't very crowded. They were very excited to see an American. You know, they yell on the street, "Where are you from?" And I'd say, and they were they were just you know they were they were terrific. And when I went into the spaces, tried to get into these spaces, you know, some of them. Um, this one was the one with the green vitrolite roof. This was in, 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 the, in the reflection. You'll see the chandelier that's with the, the two chair picture. So um, she was uh, honored that I would feel like her place was worthy of somebody from America wanting to take a picture of it. It changed, and as people, as more and more tourism came in, the attitude changed, because I was there in 2014, and they had figured out that that was of value, that the uh, that there are homes in there and interiors that they could actually monetize that. But in the beginning, people were really, really happy to open, open their doors and, and, and I paid. This woman, Isabella, I mean, the, the one thing I'll say is, the, um, no matter um, how much money I took, and you could only take a certain amount, I would always come back broke. Because at some point, every time I went in and photographed somebody's home, um, I would give them what I thought I could give them. I wanted to give them everything, but I, I had to shoot later in the afternoon, so I wanted to hang on to some for, for the whole trip. But I always came back broke. Isabella's was ill, very ill, and the photographs I made in there, I knew, sometimes I don't know what's, what's good, I uh, hope it's good. With Isabella's, I knew it was good, and I felt for her, and she was so open and so warm. I gave her a $100 bill, and she just wept um, and died uh, two months later. Yeah. So it was, and I, to this day, I, I just, you know, you feel like I could have given more, I could have given to more people, um, because I feel like I've, you know, I've gotten so much from that experience, both financially and emotionally, and as an artist, that I'll always be indebted to those people. But, um, this is, by the way, behind Michael is Isabella's mirror, so you may want to take a, a nice closer look at it now that you know a little bit more about it when the lights come on. Um, Michael, there are things that are, um, you like, seem to like couches, you seem to like mirrors, you seem to like drapes, you seem to like windows. Are there motifs that you're looking for? Are there sort of objects that help you, things that commonly occur in houses where you go that help you construct the spaces or photograph the spaces? Well, you know, for these instance, for these two pictures, I had I pulled back far enough to create to, to take these shapes and create a composition. If I had pulled back farther there would be other things that would be included in the frame and make it difficult to make a strong composition. So a lot of times Getting the right place is more important than including them. And, 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 and this one as well, it's pulled back enough, the one on the right, it's pulled back enough that you've got these three primary shapes that are related to one another and to the frame. And so it's, it's not so much that I go in, I go in, I feel something about it, I, I try to identify what it is I feel what it is that making me feel, I should say, and then I want to include those and feature them, but the, the formalism of the composition is always driving, is, is a co-driver in the boat. So many pictures have sort of nice narratives. This one, Isabella's Two Chairs, is a kind 
kind of a signature picture for you. Can you tell us a little bit more about the picture? Um, this I photographed in 99 with Isabella. And then, as I said, she died a couple months later. And I went back in 2000, and her niece had taken over the house. And there was an energy that wasn't in the 99 photo. There was the, the, the niece had put the laundry up. She had cleaned the floor, which was full of dust and, and, uh, when Isabella was there, because she just couldn't clean it up. Um, the, um, the laundry being up, just it was a sign of life. And, and the uh, chandelier? And the chandelier was interesting because in 99, there was hardly any of the crystals up. Mm -hmm. And in two, 2000, when I photographed this, the, the niece had gotten up and found the crystals and put them up. But, and it's interesting because in, an, in a big print, you can see that the ties that tied the crystals up were actually from the grocery store. Oh, a little red and blue thing. So it was like, it was so full of, it was just, it was invigorating because this woman, this young woman had come into this house and it made a difference. And, and, and the photograph was strong and the story of the two photographs was even stronger. When I went back in 2002, the, the water had won. The rain and the hole, there was a puddle on the floor about three inches deep, it seemed like, and it was just this big circle of water. And it was, it was, paint was peeling worse. And I thought, I can't photograph it. It's, it's too far gone. Can you tell us something about how you work in the spaces? For example, Julius Schulman is probably the best known historical American architecture photographer. And Julius Schulman, when he shot the Neutra houses, the Frank Lloyd Wright houses, he would carefully rearrange the furniture first so that everything would be seen from a special vantage point where he would be able to integrate the outside with the inside. If you look at um, Chez Mondrian that uh, Curtis took and some of the other pictures that he took, he was very careful to, you know, to move couches around, to push things out of the hallway, to, so he really had an idea of what they wanted the picture to look like, and they changed the space to conform to what they wanted their picture to look like, the same way that Palladori works and some of the other people that shoot fashion work. And you? Um, I, I, you know, the world is smarter than me. You know, it's like, um, the one time I learned a lesson very important in 94 or five when I went to Kill and I went to uh, Seville and I shot a Renaissance building and it was a beautiful building, great orange, great architecture, great column, great interior. And there was a set of old golf clubs, I mean golf clubs from the 50s or 40s, beat up sort of up against this, you know, 300 year old table. It was stunning. And I'm, I, I, to this day, I can regret moving those things because it was so much about what that photo was about and what I responded to that I thought, I'm never going to touch anything again in, a, in an interior. Because whatever it is, it, it's better than what I'm going to do to it. Because that's what I responded to. And so um, I, I like find, I, to me, I'm doing portraits of people in these places. And every single detail is something. Yeah. It's like the bed, that you know, that you just, you know, you can tell something about the person that sleeps in there. Yeah, and all those paintings. This was uh, uh, this was uh, all these um, Mercedes uh, ancestors. Those paintings were done by her great 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 aunt or grandmother. So all the art in this house was done by her family. And the interesting thing about this one, done in two thousand and two, was uh, when I came back in two thousand and ten, I found out that the whole house had caved in. Oh. And all that was gone, uh, except for Mercedes, was okay. Are the spaces that you are trying to shoot, the spaces that you feel, first you have, I would ask you, you have no attraction to anything new and shiny. It's, it has to say something about you. But, you know, the work, it's interesting to figure out what the work says about you and about your sense of what you connect with and what you don't connect with. But are the space, is it challenging? Are the spaces that you're trying to photograph, are they disappearing? Oh my God, yeah. It's, it's, it's always hard. <coughs> it's, uh, I did a book called Vanishing America where I photographed uh, 
and 36 states. And I still travel to some of those places, and it's just I'm shocked that things are gone. We, in, in America, we bulldoze them down and put up new things. In Europe, in South America, and Asia, we honor those things and we keep them. And we know that even though they're not spanking brand new, and that they're they're part of our culture, and they mean something. So yeah, it's it's a race. I always feel an urgency about getting to photograph things. And as you've developed as a photographer, has being a photographer changed the way that you see? Yeah, I mean, photography is not seeing. It's interesting because it's a different way of seeing. Your camera sees the world differently than you do. I don't know. I, I think that for me, the way I see the world and the way I photograph have become one and the same. In other words, I'm never off, off the clock. My mind is always looking at things and trying to learn from it. And can you talk about this photograph a little? Because I know this structure has had a past life. Yeah, this was a story. Um, yeah, it, it was basically in Cuba, you weren't allowed to, to practice Judaism. You couldn't, you couldn't do it. And so this person built this house that's called crypto um, uh, architectural, where they put these little symbols in the architecture that are sort of hidden. So the Jewish star was all over this house, but the people in Cuba didn't understand that it was about Judaism, it was you know, the Star of David. And um, so they snuck it in. And there was no temple in, in Havana uh, for the longest time. Um, and there might be one now, I'm not sure. Um, but it was a, a way to, to be Jewish and not be seen, not be discovered. But the, this is the hallway, the whole vantage point of seeing things through arches, the way the light sort of dances off the floor. It's all sort of, that was there for you. Or did you say, this is the time of the day I no, have to take it? I, I never, I never wait for the time of the day. And also, these exposures, I should say, are very long exposures. So, it's, it was very dark in here. So this might be a 30 second exposure, 40 second exposure. So, sometimes I don't have an idea of what it's gonna look like. It's more, yeah. more of an act of faith than anything. Because you keep that exposure going and things that you didn't see, like that light on the floor, I mean, I, you know, if we're in front of it right this moment, I'd say, oh yeah, I can see that. But you wouldn't have noticed it wasn't. So part of it is like the, the beauty of photography is that it doesn't photograph what you see. And some of the images like this, I mean, this shouldn't really work. There's nothing very pretty in the picture. But yet, if you look at the picture, the dynamics, the structuring, the uh, diagonal constructions, the way the forms play off each other in the spaces, it's really rather beautiful. But that's the eye of the photographer. It's also, a lot of this is about color. I mean, that <coughs> purple coming down that wall, I mean, it just, I just couldn't, I didn't know where it came from, uh, and I didn't know why it came, but I knew that it was significant, that purple with that cyan on the, on the left side. So I'm always playing with the color relationships, and part of the reason the frames I pick is sometimes to exclude a, 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 a bright yellow over here, for instance, or, or something. So the frame sort of makes the copy makes the picture. Can we talk about this picture? Because I think we have which um, is the large deco. This is interesting. Um, I photographed this in 2010 and 2014. This is 2010, I'm pretty sure. And um, yeah, it's, and I came back in 2014 and shot digitally. And so this one and the one in 2014, same exact file. Um, but I, I wish I had two prints to show you the difference. It was, it was interesting. It's just a beautiful piece of sculpture. And I think stairwells, I, there are a lot of stairwells. And anytime I see one, I'll photograph it. Because I think it's where architects have a chance to be sculptors. It's a freestanding form. It's a, it's, a, it's a piece of sculpture. And I think current in all of your work is that interest with the way spaces and shapes change. I mean, you're sort of a, a little bit of a frustrated architect. 
I am definitely. <laughs> and I'm a, I'm a terrible painter because I can never wait for paint to dry. <laughs> no way. And this is again another kind of, another treatment of um, a space, a stairway. Yeah, the, 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 both of these sort of uh, are, show the strength of, and the uniqueness of white angle of photography. Now I'm working with a view cam. So when you all think of white angle, you think of distortion and and oh, this is a wide angle, you can see it's all just the <clears throat> With a view camera, you don't have that. Because you keep it square to the subject instead of pointing up. So if you if you take a picture of a building, and you know how the building perspective goes, if you shoot that building with a four by five, you don't tilt it up, you just lift the front up. So everything's still square. So that's what these are about. They're getting a lot of information in these spaces without the distortion, and you're seeing more than the eye can see. It's wide, it's very wide angle, but the, the technique of a view camera allows you to hide the distortion. There are, um, this is, you know, really beautiful colors, and, and this is another of the two chairs, which I think you like chairs with uh, windows with. Well, the chairs are important because I think it's sort of like, Someone once said when I first started, I said, you know, I, always, I like your photographs because I always feel like somebody just entered it or just left the room. And I think that human presence is what I'm always sort of looking for. Um, it's like a stage set where it's like, you know, action and somebody comes in or somebody exits. When I was in graduate school um, in film and photography, um, the really the, the prevalent model that people used was semiotics when they sort of discussed how you read or how you understand a visual image. And in a visual image, you know, you're processing information with your eyes to your brain since you're born until you die. So you build up this enormous repository, and everybody has a little different repository of signs and what they signify. And when you see a chair like this, when you see a wall like this, when you see kind of light that embraces you like this, and the next picture, there are places that you want to inhabit that you feel are friendly. And it's basically because the signs, everything that you read from the chairs to the furniture to the shape of the room signifies something in your collective unconscious. And these are, it's interesting that sometimes you walk into a place and you can say, I know I've been here before, but you haven't been there before. But collectively, what you're looking at has tagged associations in your brain to convince you that you've been there before. It's, you know, there's a kind of a law that's a forensics law where people describe something that happened to them and they can swear it happened to them, but they didn't actually happen to them. It's a memory that's not, um, it's not a memory that's a, uh, an honest memory. But your brain and your imagination are powerful, and I think when Michael uses these spaces and shows these spaces, there are all sorts of subtle things that are happening, that you look at them and they embrace you. They make you, and they, they trigger different things for Michael that, you know, that he's probably not aware of that attract him to the spaces, but the spaces become, they signify things, and when you look, at different spaces in different countries, <clears throat> you know, you could swear sometimes you've been to a museum, you've been there, they make you feel a specific way, and they either create a comfort zone for you, or sometimes, you know, you're a place and you have an eerie feeling that you shouldn't be here, that you want to get out of here. <clears throat> Michael fortunately gives us these spaces that we want to be in, but just how we, just to understand, how you read these spaces and how you read this information is very subtle, very complex, and very sophisticated. But for Michael's work, it means <coughs> everything. So okay. another set of a staircase, Michael, in Buenos Aires. Yeah. This is very sort of architectural. You, you know, it's interesting. It's, um, talk about collective consciousness. It's, 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 it always amazes me. Not anymore. When somebody comes up to me and I say, I really like this photograph because of that, that, that. And I go, funny, that's why I photograph it. And it, so it always surprises me that we, that, we, that we all sort of are so different, but we're all very similar. And this is, has sort of some of the same color harmonies that are in uh, the Cuba pictures. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is and doorways again. This is a same model. It's a that's actually a mirror. It's the weirdest thing. A mirror. Yeah. I, I had to sneak out of that to shoot it. I was had a long cable release and it was way over to one side. You can see it. There's a tripod light leg in there somewhere. But it, it, it still throws me, and I still can't figure out the space. And I was there. No, that's a beautiful picture. And again, another staircase, very formal. And this, you know, if you grew up and you were, you know, could get into privileged spaces, this has to tag certain memories and certain, you know, it signifies certain things about class and culture. When I was a kid, I would draw all the time uh, in school because I was bored. And I would draw, like, 3D perspective drawings. So I, was, I, I didn't realize how important that was to me. But when I look at this picture, you see that vertical line on the left, and you see where the, the dots on the bottom, and you see the amount of spaces on the right. Those things are all determined by where I put the camera. And those are all relationships that I create by where I put the camera. And when it's off, it's like an orchestra that's got a violin that's flat. It doesn't work. It's got to be kind of harmonious. It's got to work. And you can tell us again about, you know, you had a show in New York and the photographer at the gallery in New York decided to have the prints made. And how important it is to you that the color harmonies are perfectly balanced. Right. Um, it's all about that. I mean, it's all about what color that red is. It, now, I'll tell you, I try to be accurate. So if I'm printing something, I'll look for something in the photograph that's neutral and start there. <coughs> I try to photograph accurately, but I tend to remo remember romantically. People in Cuba thought, um, my Cuba work thought, oh, he's just jamming the saturation up in Photoshop. The truth is, the exposures are so long, I had to do the other thing. I had to desaturate to get back to what that harmony I thought I saw. And the, and the open doors are sort of, is anything for you symbolic? Is it cultural? Is it sort of? Kind of a bit of romantic and magical? Or? This one certainly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very mysterious. The blue is because that was daylight, so it went blue, and the inside was, shut, shut, uh, was lit with incandescent. And usually, as a photographer, it's a no no. You know, you, you never want to mix those colors because you get, you get these crazy things that are unreal. But in this case, it seemed like this room, that I didn't even go in it, but it just marble room back there in bathed in blue seemed to be a different dimension or something. I like a question. <clears throat> I think it's the most important thing in the world for a piece of art to continue to ask a question or questions that you look at and are, are engaged in trying to answer and never really being able to, but always wanting to come back. Some of the spaces that you photograph are sort of empty spaces that give you room to sort of breathe in and some are just uh, jam-packed full of objects. So is there any uh, rhyme or reason to, I mean, this is beautiful, but it's a completely open space, almost abstract. Well, when I, this was later, and um, I was doing a, a body of work called Urban Luminosity, which was shooting contemporary architecture at night, and for color, lumen, luminosity, reflection. And so when I was photographing the interior, that sort of became a factor in my thinking of photographing the light. It's about the it is light. Of light. Yeah, and um, and also it's a you know shooting <coughs> into a brightly lit window is something that's very difficult yeah. to create. If we can go back a couple, I wanted to show you um, <coughs> that. One. So this one, I want to talk real briefly about the digital. This only light in this thing is a chandelier. So when you look at this thing, when I first got it back from, when I first saw it on my computer, it was a black picture with a picture of the chandelier lit perfectly. And, 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 and it was dark, and I was like, oh, no. And I missed it. So this, this new software, you know, normally what you do is you go in here with a whole set of lights and a lighting crew. I never use lights, it's always natural. And um, I've become good at printing and in Photoshop uh, now and before in the dark room to be able to burn and dodge and make things work. This thing, there was a dial in the software that came with this camera 
if you if it said shadow and you just crank it to the right, and all of a sudden it lit up like <coughs> the walls lit up, the floor lit up, the ceiling lit up. So when people ask me, what do I like better, film or digital? It's like I, I, I would have never thought I'd be saying this, but I, I would say digital's better. I don't. He uses a phase one, so for all of those that want to run out and buy one, it's about a $65,000 camera. So. Yes. I, drive, I drive two very old I, show. I drive two very old cars and a new camera. <laughs> So this is, I think we're going to sort of move through some of these. This is a picture which is really beautiful at uh, the organization of the space. I mean, you see something very real, but every kind of lunette of the, of the uh, door is, is an abstract painting. So yeah. it's, did no, you I, see that when you, that was attracted you to? Yeah, uh, I, I don't remember if I opened the door. I don't think I did. Um, I might have, because I would, I would have been seen. Um, yeah, I, I love that. I love, I love the more you can, the more information, the more questions that you can create in a photograph, piece of art. Today. And again, this one relates to the lights filling in. Yeah, it's a, you know, another Italian interior. Um, it was tough in Italy because so many of the rooms were not lived in. So there was not museums, but they weren't really lived in. Cuba taught me that the more I could find places that are lived in, Better, better photograph would be. And this again is uh, really much more formal. A study of arches, architecture, shapes that uh, kind of uh, reflect and, and move one on top of another. Yeah, sometimes there are things that don't fit with what I'm doing, but they're just so captivating. You know, digital, it's now it's free. One click is, didn't cost me $10 the way it used to. And this again, the mirrors, the reflections, but it's almost abstract. This one's so strange because normally I'm very frontal, straight ahead, and this photograph was one of the only ones I've ever come from a, an angle, and, and and one of my favorite photographs, mm -hmm. one that I that, that it continues. I, I want, when I'm in a situation, I'm looking for this situation because it's a it's just a different different situ different skill set. But if you, yeah, if you were frontal, like you normally enter, you welcome us into a room. This is the way, or into a hallway, or into a stairway. But if you were frontal, you would miss all of the sort of receding planes and that sort of diagonal sort of structure of arches that you're seeing in the mirror. Yeah. It's, but elementally, it's just a three or four forms, just like the early black and white stuff I was doing in the same then. It's just seeing those shapes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a template. And again, the hallway. Yeah, I just I love doors open. I love Another it. one. <laughs> and that sometimes is, you know, really sort of over the top with um, the architectural elements and painted elements. And I sort of see as a frustrated painter here. Yeah, well, I'm. Okay, this is America. And. I have something to like to ask Michael about, you know, the way he shoots in America because the pictures are completely different and we may be, you know, like to, to schedule a sort of a museum show for the American work. We are a young country. This is a, a strange place in America where everybody sort of, when you ask somebody what they are, they'll come out and they'll say, well, they're half Irish, they're a third German, they're you know, we look for roots, we look for connections, we look for a sense of coming from a tradition. Um, everybody is like sending in this for 23andMe and Ancestry.com, because everybody's trying to find, you know, we're, Europeans consider us a very insecure country, and everybody's trying to find from where they came to what they belong. And when you look at the American work that Michael shot, it's a totally different kind of, what was your experience doing it? You can't shoot it the way, other than the one, which is really beautiful in the, uh, the Aikens Red House, which is gorgeous, which is this whole room back here. But what's your experience working in America? Well, um, very front, you know, I, I, I drive around a lot, as I said before, rubbernecking, looking all the time. I've been really aware of, because I've been in St. Louis so long, I was shooting the same walls over and over again. 
mean, not because I didn't remember them. Uh, that's getting to be the point now. <laughs> but at the time, I just, I was, I wanted to work, so it was hard to afford to travel. I wasn't sure what I wanted to shoot. Cuba was a, was a game changer in Europe. So these were basically frontal like I had always done, straight on, and to tell the story about what was the, what were these businesses? Um, what were they about? Um, what did they say about us? About shooting these things, things started to disappear. A Chinese to go yellow building in red, gone. I had photographed it. All that was left was my photograph. So I realized that what I was looking at, what I was interested in, the 50s in which I grew up, um, was disappearing. And it meant a lot. It meant a lot to me just from my, my childhood, my, my history. So I kept starting making those photographs and realizing that there was a plot for me, a sense of urgency. And we can sort of see that and see some. But somehow it's, you know, the information is much more stripped down information. It doesn't, it reads differently. And I would ask you, are there, you know, and I, it doesn't relate to the work so much, but maybe it does, are there photographers that are inspirational to you? People that, you know, you hold in high esteem? Well, um, certainly Walker Evans, what he was photographing. Kristen Berry, that frontal approach. Uh, Edward Weston, leaving, looking at things the way they are and not changing them. Um, you know, I, I, I like, uh, there's so much that I like, it's, it's hard. But um, Ajay certainly was, was sure. you know, yeah, that was, that was, yeah, that was basically what I think I'm doing now, especially with America. Yeah. What is, is uh, you know, I think all of that's beautiful. Michael was, talking and he said, you know, he's been around since 1973. He had big shows at, uh, in uh, Washington U and he's been showing since 73. And he said, you know, in his beginning, he had this big fancy, what he thought was a big fancy opening. He was all ready, eight people showed up. Uh, and he said, you know, somebody wanted to buy a photograph. Michael said, you know, I've worked very hard. This is one of my, you know, best photographs thus far. How much is it? It's $40, and the woman said to him, 40. Dollars. Well, no sale at forty dollars. So, but he said, you know, back then photographers were photographers. Now photographers have been sort of mainstreamed into the larger art market. Can you talk about your feelings now as about the photography market as opposed to how you grew up in it and sort of cut your teeth? Yeah. No, I, I I loved photography at the beginning. Um, I, I loved it before it became. An, an art form. I, I thought it was uniquely its own its own thing. It, it, it was craft, it was art, it was a lot of things. But it was a different world. When I was working on the zone system um, at that time, uh, I had problems with Ansel Adams' formulas. And I thought, well, who the hell am I going to talk to? Pick up the phone, dial 411, and ask for the number Carmel, California for Ansel Adams. Do you want me to ring it? I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> phone, the phone rings twice, Ansel Adams. I go, oh my God. <laughs> uh, Mr. Adams, I'm working on your zone system. Look, I'm having a problem with my agitation. What should I do? Can you imagine me calling somebody today and saying, like a famous photographer, and saying, where was that interior you shot? I really like it. I want to go there. there. Yeah. So it's, it's changed in the... I, I mean, I talked to Aaron Siskin on the phone, I talked to uh, uh, Brett Weston, I talked to Harry Callahan, I sent them work, they, they sent me notes back with it. It was a different, it was a different world. It was more collegiate. Yeah. And you had a connection with it, and everybody was willing to share. It, yeah, there was, no, there was not the pretension that there is now. And, and the money creates a sort of an insecurity in the market. The photographers all look to look at other photographers, not in the same way. Not the pictures that they took, but what their market exposure is and yeah. where they're showing. And, and the other thing was that I never, you know, I mean, some, it's funny, when I first began, commercial photographers looked at me like I was nuts for doing fine art. What are you wasting your time doing zone system? We should be out, you know, getting clients. And the fine art people were going, oh, you do commercial work? 
<laughs> you know, it's like, are you? Okay. Yeah. And so there was. I did both. I like commercial work. I like commercial work because it was structured. I didn't have to ask any questions about what I was doing or why. I didn't have to get better each time. Each time. I didn't. I didn't have dreams in it. It was a way to make a living, and it was a way to learn how to take over. Learn about the technical. Uh, I'm going to share with uh, you guys something that uh, other people haven't seen so far. It's just a way to end because I know I try to keep these things in an hour, so I guess I got three minutes and then open it up to questions. I know that, you know, I promised people it would be an hour. So Michael um, has a small health or medium health issues to deal with and has not been making global trips lately, but has been doing something very, very beautiful and uh, for him, looking at uh, a subject matter in his own backyard, he's gone to make a series of cyanotypes, which are organic forms that work with iron as opposed to silver on the paper. When iron's tagged by light, it turns blue rather than gray. And can you talk a little bit about your newest body of work? And we're gonna be showing it next door, by the way, in uh, alternate process show at the JL Modern, I think in March and April, if I'm correct. But uh, we're gonna be showing it, and nobody's really, no gallery has shown it yet. But I just want Michael to give you a couple minutes about what it's all about. Interestingly enough, this photograph and that photograph are so related. It's, you know, if you do a, a line drawing, basic forms of this, and the basic forms of that, they're not far off. So it's sort of, that's the template. I still have that template when I'm doing these. The thing I loved about these was the ability to take a picture digitally, download it, get it on my computer, mess with it, print it, um, create a negative, coat a sheet of 30 by 44 inch watercolor paper with the emulsion, let it dry, drop the negative on top of it, you can put it out in the sun, or I have a contact printer. It's basically like a UV light is what tags. It's like a sun, necessary to have UV light. So it's like a sun sun roof. I mean, tanning roof. <coughs> and and then and I can wash it off, put it on a dryer, and in four hours I have a piece of artwork. And the immediacy of it goes back to 1972 when I saw that print appear in the developer out of nowhere. The magic. And so it gave me an opportunity when I had back surgery, so fusion, I couldn't carry anything, I couldn't walk much, but I could shuffle to the park, our beautiful forest park in St. Louis, and take pictures of these trees and create a, a, something different. Um, and I, I just, I am so excited about, about, these, about these pieces, you know, because I love this blue, I, I've always loved that. And they're really not darkroom prints. The, the whole sense of the cyanotyping goes back to the 1840s. And so it's, an, it's very organic to use you know, minerals, to use just natural water to fix the pictures. I mean, it's very, it sort of connects with the birth of photography. So I think you, know, you come full circle and you come back to see something in a very different way. And for Michael, you know, I could predict it would happen. Because when you go to eastmanimages.com, you can look at all different bodies of work. We're showing a sort of a selection. But Michael has always had sort of uh, intellectual curiosity, a restless spirit. So there are all these accomplished from the equestrian work to the work on reflections <coughs> to this. There's all <coughs> different bodies of work that we could show. But these are the bodies that we want to show. But we're very excited to be the first gallery that will be showing the cyanotypes. So that being said, I thank you all for coming. If you have questions for Michael. <laughs> and the other group is 15, 15 minutes from now, if you want a quick